need help with GED science? Well, in this video, I'm going to teach you some tips, tricks, and strategies to beat questions similar to what you'll get on the GED science test. Now, note that this video is part two in the series, so if you're coming from part one, welcome back. And if you're new here, note that you don't have to have watched part one first. You can start right now, but I'll put the link to part one down below. Okay, let's jump in. Okay, so to start off, it says select the answer that describes how deforestation could disrupt the life cycle of something, something, I'm not going to try to pronounce this, in, a, in tropical rainforests. Okay, so let's read the passage here. The passage says deforestation, and I know this is kind of boring and kind of dry, but unfortunately there's not really a better way to plow ahead than to just jump in. So it says tropical rainforests contain diverse communities of organisms with many interesting relationships. One such relationship connects parasitic fungi and their insect hosts. A type of parasitic fungus, called something something, disperses spores onto the forest floor, but cannot successfully grow on the ground. The fungus requires specific conditions and must grow inside of specific ant species called the host to reproduce. The ants, various species of carpenter ant, make nests in the trees. Oh, something, I don't know how to pronounce that, feeds on and grows inside the insect host, and within a few days, the fungus affects the insect's brain. The insect exhibits unusual behaviors such as wandering away from the colony to where light and humidity favor fungal growth. Just before dying, the insect bites into and firmly attaches itself to a plant. Then the fungus slowly grows outward from the dead insect's head, producing a pod of spores that eventually bursts open, the spores fall to the ground, restarting the life cycle of the fungus. Though this relationship may sound gruesome, researchers note that these parasitic fungi may help maintain biodiversity in the tropical forest. Some parasitic fungi may be host-specific, meaning that a fungus species only infects a particular type of insect. Scientists have observed that if an insect population begins to grow, more fungal infections occur and then the insect population levels off again. This relationship may prevent overpopulation of the habitat by any one species. Some research, and this is deforestation or clearing away trees, is occurring in tropical rainforests. Some researchers are studying parasitic fungi for use as insecticides due to the natural ability to penetrate and destroy insect tissues. Other researchers argue that there are a few potential uses for the fungi as insecticides with multiple targets. Okay, and so I, I expect that you'll take your time, pause the video, and you know you can reread this, uh, take all the time you need with this. But basically, remember that the question says, select the answer that describes how deforestation could disrupt the life cycle of something something in tropical rainforest. So the answer choices say, the something something fungus relies upon a specific ant species which make their nests in tropical rainforest trees. The blank blank feeds on and grows inside the insect host. The fungi entirely control the insect's behavior. Clearing of trees enables the fungus to grow on the ground. So go ahead and pause the video. Feel free to rewind or do whatever you need to do. Take all the time you need to and then we'll go over it. So questions like this are just kind of a pain because you've got, you're going to have the time limit on the test ticking down and there's a lot of information here in this passage and not all of it's going to be relevant to answering the question and understanding which parts of the passage are important and which parts aren't. It's just kind of takes, just kind of takes some judgment and wisdom to figure that out in practice. Um, so let's go through each answer choice here and let's see how we can answer the question. All right. So the first answer choice says the blank blank fungus, and I'm just going to say blank because I can't pronounce this, relies upon a specific ant species which make their nests in tropical rainforest trees. So a good thing to do is kind of always just um, look, find words in this part of the answer choice like trees and ant species and just see, just kind of skim the passage and see if any of these words kind of pop out at you. So what I see here is the ants and I see the trees and Nest is another big word I see. So this part right here is kind of talking about how the fungus requires, the fungus requires specific conditions. So in order for it to grow, it has to be inside of the ant. Okay. And it says that the ants are going to make nests in the trees. So the ants are making nests in the trees and the uh, fungi has to grow inside of the ants. It seems kind of like if we chop down the trees, that is going to affect the ant nest, which in turn seems like it would affect the fungus. 
I don't know, just I'm not an expert on this topic by any means. I actually don't know hardly anything about this topic, but by common sense, A kind of looks like it's making sense here. Um, a is definitely a true statement, so A has that going for it here. And the topic is about deforestation, which is right here, it tells us, is clearing away the trees. So A is kind of looking like it's the right answer here. But let's look at the others. So this one says the blank blank feeds on and grows inside the insect host. All right, so it already, so, you know, it already kind of talks about how the, it has to grow inside of the uh, ant or the insect, but feeds on and grows. If I had to kind of find that in the passage, I see right here, uh, blank, blank, feeds on and grows inside of the insect host. So this answer choice is, is looking like this is a true statement. Okay, so this is a true statement. Um, and so when multiple answer choices look like they are true statements, what that usually is a clue that you have to do is to go back and reread the question and make sure that uh, you have to find the answer choice that's a true statement, but the one that also answers the question. So this is a true statement, but it doesn't really tell us much about deforestation. Um, it doesn't really have that much to do with disrupting the life cycle. It's just a true statement. Um, so let's look at the other two here. So the fungi entirely control the insect's behavior. Uh, so you could kind of pick out the word behavior here, and so I don't recall, I'm not going to go back and reread this, but I don't remember it saying that it completely controls the behavior. I remember, I remember it says right here that the fungus is going to affect the insect's brain, and it's going to cause it to wander away from the colony and essentially die. So I guess this is a true statement here, although it, it doesn't directly say this in the passage. You can kind of read between the lines. If you just look at this section here, it helps you kind of read between the lines. So this is also going to be a true statement, but I'm not sure that this has that much to do with deforestation. So now basically this last answer choice here where it says clearing of trees enables the fungus to grow on the ground. Is this a true statement? Well, remember, it tells us up here that they can't successfully grow on the ground. So this is not even a true statement. So we can just eliminate this one altogether. So basically, because this one's false and these three statements are true, we know that one of these three it could be the answer because these are all correct statements, but we've got to tie it back into what the question is asking us, which here the question has to do with deforestation. The only thing that really deals with that would be answer choice A, and that's because, you know, they make their nests in the trees, so if you cut down the trees, there's going to be fewer nests, obviously, and if there's fewer nests, that's going to be problematic for the life cycle, so I'm thinking this is going to be the right answer. So let me take a shot at that here, and yes, we are correct. It says, so here is the answer rationale and the question overview, and it says the question requires you to select evidence from the stimulus using reasoning to make, you know, I won't read all this. I'll just let you pause the video, and you can read all this if you want to, and then when you're ready, we'll go on to the next question. Do you want to teach the next science problem, Tommy? No? Okay, thanks anyway. So we've got another question here, but the good news is that it's the same exact passage. So it says here, which fact from the passage supports the argument that parasitic fungi offer at best severely limited potential as insecticides that target many kinds of insects? We have A, the fungi reproduce inside an insect's body. B, the fungi entirely control the insect's behavior. C, some of the fungi may be host-specific parasites. Or D, some of the fungi produce pods that grow from an insect's head. So here you go. You can pause the video, take all the time you need in the world, and then when you're ready, uh, we'll go over whether or not you got the right answer. And we're just here to learn, so I don't care if you got get this right or not. Uh, it's just practice, so go ahead and try this out. So we know that this is a true statement. Um, do the fungi reproduce inside an insect's body? Well, I know that it basically tells us that the insect bites firmly into a plant. The fungus is going to grow outward from the dead insect's head. And then it's going to produce those spores that fall to the ground that restarts the life cycle. So I'm not sure that they reproduce inside the insect's body. Um, it's more that they are growing out of the insect's head and then the spores are going to uh, be produced and burst open and fall to the ground. So maybe this is true. I'm not sure exactly. So this might be true, might not be true. It's not really clear here. I can't really tell if this statement's true or not just based off of this. So, you know, we can kind of leave this answer choice in, but this doesn't, I don't think this is going to be right. Uh, it says down here, some of the fungi may be host-specific parasites. So what does that really mean? Hmm, so if a fungi species only infects a particular type of insect, that seems like that is basically, if we look down here at this last sentence, where it says, other researchers argue that there are few potential uses for the fungi as insecticides with multiple targets. So it looks like 
The fungi could be used to prevent against certain um, insects, but it might not work against any random insect, right? It's host specific, meaning it's only going to affect, infect certain insects, not just any random insect. So that means that it would have limited use as an insecticide because uh, it's only going to infect certain insects. So, you know, some random insects that may be causing harm or that we want to use an insecticide against, uh, the fungi might not work against them unless it's a specific uh, type of insect. So the answer here is going to be, I think, this one right here. So let me just pick this one right here, and let's see. And yes, we're right. So here's the answer rationale, and I will read this one here quickly. It says, the excerpt states that some parasitic fungi only infect a particular type of insect. As a result of this fact, it would not be effective to use parasitic fungi as a general insecticide since they do not affect large populations of insects. So basically what I was just saying, just worded differently. Uh, so you can pause the video, take all the time you need to read the explanation, and then when you're ready, we'll keep rolling. Okay, the next question says, Newton's second law of motion states that the acceleration of an object is dependent on the object's mass and the amount of force applied to the object. The table shows data from an investigation of Newton's second law. Which statement describes the pattern established in the data included in the chart? A doubling of the net force increases acceleration four times when the object's mass is constant. A doubling of the net force decreases acceleration two times when the object's mass is constant. A doubling of the mass decreases the acceleration of the object by half when the net force is constant. Or a doubling of the mass increases the acceleration of the object two times when the net force is constant. So let me expand this here if you want to see this here. Here's the table again if you want to see it a little bit bigger. Now let me go back here. Is our, here are our answers. So you can pause the video, try this one out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so this question here, uh, let me go over how to do a question like this. And you just have to learn how to kind of think through these questions here. This one's not... Um, terribly as tricky as it might seem, right? It might seem a lot more intimidating than it really is. And that's understandable. So let's break down how to beat this type of question. So it tells us a doubling of the net force increases the acceleration four times when the mass is constant. So first of all, when something is always constant, what does that mean? Well, I want to find two cases in the chart where the mass is the same, and I want to compare them. So here I see, okay, so if I look at this case here, I see that we've got two as our mass. And if I look at this case down here, I see that I also have two as a mass. So that would be so that would mean I could compare these two cases. Now I could also do the case where the mass is four with the other case where the mass is four. All right, but the point is, if it says the mass is constant, I want you to pick out two cases on the chart here where the mass is the same number. I don't care if you pick uh, the cases where we've got twos or if we've got fours. Doesn't really matter here. We just need to pick two cases like I've shown in red here where the mass is the same. So let's see if this is true. A doubling of the net force increases acceleration four times. Okay, so let's look at the first case here where the net force is eight. So they double it, it becomes 16. So we see here eight, and then in this case it's doubled, it became 16. So how does our acceleration change? So in the first case here, the acceleration is four. Then in the next case, it is eight. So when the net force doubled, it looks to me like the acceleration also doubled because four times two is eight. So this is gonna be false, right? It did not increase four times, it only increased two times, it doubled. So A is false. Okay. You know what, let me just, uh, yeah, let me clear all this writing out of the road here a little bit, there we go. And we'll remember that A is false. So B, let's check B. A doubling of the net force decreases acceleration two times when the object's mass is constant. So the when the object's mass is constant, we need to look at two cases where the mass is constant. So we just use the twos. Let's look at the cases with the fours. All right, so let me call this case one here, and let me call this case two here. And again, when the mass is constant, all that's telling me is I have to pick two cases where the mass is a four in both cases here. And again, like I just said, it's perfectly okay to compare the two cases where the twos match if you'd like to. So it says a doubling of the net force decreases acceleration two times. So 
Here we see in case one, the force was eight, and in case two, it's 16. So here the force doubled. What happened to the acceleration? The acceleration, bam, also doubled. So it didn't decrease, it's actually going to increase. It's not gonna be cut in half. Um, it's not going to decrease two times. It's going to double. So this is also gonna be false. Okay, so let me clear this all out of the road and let's look at the next one here. So let's look at C. A doubling of the mass decreases the acceleration of the object by half when the net force is constant. So this time, we wanna find two cases where the net force is the same. So we can use the eights. You could also just pick the two cases where it's 16. Doesn't really matter. I'm just gonna pick the eights just to start somewhere here for the sake of the example. So let me call this one case one, and let me call this one case two. So a doubling of the mass decreases the acceleration by half. So let's look here. In this case here, we have two, and in this case we have four. So from case one to case two, we see that the mass doubled. But if we look at the acceleration, we see that in case one we had four, but in case two we had two. So what happened to the acceleration? The acceleration was cut in half. So we see that when the net force was held constant and the mass doubled, the acceleration was cut in half. So that sounds exactly like answer choice C. So let's take a shot here. Let's see, and yes, that is correct. Okay, so here is our answer rationale. Um, I'm assuming it's gonna be very similar to what I just showed you here. So you can take the time if you want to to pause the video, really take the time to read this and make sure you understand this. Then when you're ready, we'll keep rolling. The next question says, the diagram shows an event that occurs during meiosis. What is the result of this event? A, chromosomes that are genetically identical to the parental chromosome. B, chromosomes that are genetically identical to the maternal chromosome. C, chromosomes that are a genetic combination of the parent chromosomes. Or lastly, chromosomes that contain a different amount of genetic information than the parents. So let's have you pause the video, try this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over it. Okay, so just like a lot of topics on GED science, um, you know, you don't have to know really anything about that topic going in to figure out the question. Um, now, meiosis and mitosis are two topics from like high school biology that are rather complicated and really we can answer this question basically just by looking at the chart here rather than having to actually know much about meiosis. Basically what I want you to see in the diagram here is that we've got one chromosome from dad, which is the paternal, one chromosome from mom, so we've got a paternal and a maternal chromosome. We see here that they're gonna cross and we see that the new, two new chromosomes that are produced all right, are gonna be different colors, all right? Meaning the red chromosome is, is from dad, the blue is from mom, and we look down here at the result, and we see that the new chromosomes that are made, one is mostly red with a little blue, one is mostly blue with a little bit of red, so we see that they are not genetically identical. If they were identical, we would just have one red one and one blue one. All right, it says chromosomes that are genetically identical to the maternal chromosome, that would mean that both of these were all blue, which is not what we see. Chromosomes that are a genetic combination of the parent chromosomes. That would be, that looks like that's gonna be the golden ticket here, and that is correct. So again, as always, you can take your time, you can uh, pause the video and you can read the explanation if you'd like to, add anything to your notes that you want to, then when you're ready, we'll go on to the next question. Okay, the next question says, which excerpt from the text supports this inference? Ocean acidity levels and fish. Dissolved CO2 creates carbonic acid in ocean water. Rising ocean acidity levels may harm marine life. For example, high acid levels may cause hearing loss. Scientists conducted an investigation to study the effect of increased acidity on fish hearing. A group of fertilized fish eggs from the same parents were divided into four different aquariums, each with a different pressure of CO2. One tank contained the normal atmospheric conditions of 390 microatmospheres of CO2. The other tanks contained 600, 700, and 900 microatmospheres of CO2, respectively. The same number of eggs was placed into each aquarium. The eggs hatched and the fish lived in these aquariums until testing. To prepare for the experiment, one fish was placed into an aquarium containing the same CO2 pressure in which it was raised. The fish's position was recorded every five seconds for two minutes. 
Then sounds from a predatory fish were played from an underwater speaker at one end of the aquarium at a volume that was only audible to the fish when swimming near the speaker. The fish's position was recorded every five seconds for two minutes. Trials were repeated with fish from each tank. The study showed that fish raised in elevated CO2 levels did not avoid the sounds of the predator fish. They spent approximately the same proportion of time at the speaker and in the aquarium before and after the sounds of the predator fish were played. However, the fish from the aquarium with the normal atmospheric CO2 pressure avoided the speaker and of the aquarium after the predator sounds were played. Scientists infer from the investigation that fish raised in water with higher levels of acidity have difficulty hearing predator sounds. So it tells us here which excerpt from the text supports this inference. And the inference, of course, is this last sentence right here. That's what it's talking about when it says which excerpt from the text supports this inference. And the answer choices say rising ocean levels may harm marine life. For example, high acid levels may cause hearing loss. B says then sounds from a predatory fish were played from an underwater speaker at one end of the aquarium at a volume that was only audible to the fish when swimming near the speaker. C says the other tanks contained 600, 700, 900 microatmospheres of CO2 respectively. And the last answer choice says the study showed that fish raised in elevated CO2 levels did not avoid the sounds of predatory fish. So let's have you pause the video, take all the time you need with this question, and when you're ready, we'll go over it. Okay, so let's talk about this question here. So basically, these answer choices are each word-for-word uh, -for -word copy and paste uh, from the passage here. So we know that these are all going to be true statements. It's just a matter of which one is going to help the scientists infer from the investigation that fish raised in water levels with higher levels of acidity have difficulty hearing. So we have to find something that is directly relevant to this last sentence down here. So this answer choice right here where it says the other tanks contain 600, 700, 900 microatmospheres of CO2, that doesn't really tell us much. That's kind of just explaining the experimental procedure. So we can take this out right off the bat. So what about this first sentence here? The first answer choice, it says, rising ocean acidity levels may harm marine life. For example, high acid levels may cause hearing loss. So this is making a statement about hearing loss and high acid levels, but this isn't telling us about um, a difference between fish raised in higher acidity versus uh, normal atmospheric CO2. So while this is a true statement here, this is not, uh, this doesn't really help us uh, infer from the investigation that fish raised in water with higher levels of acidity have difficulty hearing predator sounds. So what about this one right here? It says, then sounds from a predatory fish were played from an underwater speaker at one end of the aquarium at a volume that was only audible to fish when swimming near the speaker. So to check if this could be the right answer or not, we want to find this, let's find this text in the passage here. Because this whole thing is a quote directly out of the passage. And so we've got to think about this in the context here. So what's happening here, it tells us in the first sentence that one fish was placed into an aquarium containing the same CO2 pressure in which it was raised. So we've got an aquarium and we've got basically, let's just say normal CO2 levels. Okay, so in this tank, we've got a bunch of fish under, I'll just put NCO2 for normal CO2. Okay. And what happens is, you know, the fish are going to avoid the sound, right? It tells us that uh, the fish is gonna, the fish's position is measured, it's gonna go back and forth, and it tells us that fish raised, tells us down here that the fish raised in the normal atmospheric CO2 pressure avoided the speaker. So we've got fish in a tank here, and let's say that this is a speaker right here. I know this is, doesn't look much like a speaker, but let's say this is a speaker here, and I can't draw a fish to save my life. Uh, so let's just say that that's a little fish. And the fish is basically swimming back and forth around the tank. And basically that's supposed to be an arrow, but the fish is going back and forth around the tank. And when it gets closer to the speaker, it's going to avoid the speaker, right? It tells us fish from the aquarium with the normal CO2 pressure avoided the speaker end of the aquarium. We've got the fish, we've got the speaker, and the fish moves around. They're capturing the position. It doesn't want to get close to the speaker. But in the case here, and the speaker is making sounds of predators, right? So if a smaller fish wants to avoid a bigger fish, it wants to avoid being eaten. If it hears the sounds of a bigger fish, it's going to want to swim away. 
But here it's showing us that, let's say this is the tank here, let's say this is the tank with high CO2 levels. So high CO2 levels. We've got, again, we've got a speaker at one end of the tank. Here is my beautiful speaker that would never win a war, an award in an art contest. It would probably get me last place in an art contest, but let's say this is my imaginary speaker. You really have to be open-minded to watch my channel, especially when I'm drawing. Because um, let's say that this is a fish right here. It looks kind of like some sort of an oval circle thing, kind of, I don't know what it is, but say that's a fish. And in high CO2 levels, the fish is going to swim around and it's not going to avoid the speaker, right? It tells us here, the study showed that fish raised in elevated CO2 levels did not avoid the sounds of the predator fish. Okay, so in normal CO2, the fish doesn't want to get anywhere near the uh, sounds of the predator. It doesn't want to get eaten. But when we raise the CO2 level, the fish is going to just swim around and it might go close to that speaker. It might not, but it, it's not trying to avoid the sound of the predators. So why would a fish not avoid uh, the sound of a predator? Well, either two options. Either one, the fish is crazy and it wants to get eaten, um, but more likely it's because it can't hear it. It's having trouble hearing. So this answer choice right here is not correct because this is describing what happens in the normal CO2 case, all right? And right here it's telling us the study showed that the fish raised in elevated CO2 levels did not avoid the sound of the predator fish which helps us to infer that when there's higher levels of acid, there's difficulty hearing. Now, you might say, well, Parker, uh, this is talking about elevated CO2 levels, not acidity. Well, you've got to go back to the first sentence here where it tells us that dissolved CO2 creates carbonic acid in the water. So if there's more CO2 uh, that's dissolving in the water, there's going to be more acid in the water. So that's also that connection between the CO2 and the acid levels. Um, so higher CO2 levels and higher levels of acidity are, are, I'm assuming, correlated based off of this sentence right here. That's what this sentence seems to be telling us. Okay, and to make a long story short here, this looks like the correct answer, so let me get my drawing tool out of the road here, and we will check on the answer. Let's see, I think I want to do this. Here we go. Let's see if this is the right answer. Now, that would be kind of funny if after, well, it wouldn't be funny for me, but it'd probably be hilarious for those watching. If after all that explanation, I actually got the wrong answer. But it looks like we are right. We're good to go here. And so if you had trouble understanding this one, you know, this would be a good one to pause and just make sure you understand this. Yeah, we've got to deal with this passage yet again for the next question here. So uh, the next question says, identify the independent and dependent variable in the investigation. And so let's have you pause the video, try to do this, and then when you're ready, we'll go over it. And you might need to kind of rewind a little bit uh, to read passage if you need to see different parts of the passage here we try to minimize it uh it's probably too hard to read that way anyway i'll stop rambling i'll let you pause the video try this one out and then we'll go over it independent dependent variable what are we talking about here well i actually uh i in my uh gd science study guide video i think i dealt with this exact same question um that's also part of the reason why in this this last question um this passage also the last question, I don't think I got that same exact question on the GED study guide video that I did, um, but I think it was using the same passage. This question, I think, is identical to the question in a different video that I've already covered this. Um, and so, but basically, uh, if you haven't seen that video, what you need to understand here is that, you know, there's two different variables going on here, right? So let me draw my tank right here, okay? And if you want to laugh at my art skills, that's fine. You won't offend me. I know it's pretty bad. But let's say this is a tank. This is the water. This is actually really bad, um, but anyway, this is the tank, this is the water, we've got the fish in the water here, and the, we've got our CO2, okay. And so we know that we've got the speaker at the one end here, and we know that if we increase the CO2, the fish is gonna essentially spend more time near the speaker. But if we raise it in normal CO2, so if we decrease the CO2 back down to normal, we know that when the CO2 levels are normal, we know that that fish is going to probably stay this in this part of the tank. It's going to stay away from the speaker. So what we know here is that when we change the CO2 level, it's going to change the position of the fish, meaning we decrease the CO2 back to normal. The fish will stay farther away from the speaker. If we increase that CO2, the fish will kind of move wherever it wants, getting close to the speaker, not really caring. Um, so what we can say here is that the position of the fish depends on the CO2 level, all right? 
because we could change the position of the fish and that's not going to change the CO2 level. So think about it this way, right? If we put the fish in the tank and let me draw another beautiful tank right here and or not so beautiful, I should say. So here's our speaker and here's our fish. If we were to like, I don't know, reach in here with a net and grab a hold of the fish and move the fish closer to the speaker. So in other words, if we were to change the position of the fish, that's not going to have any effect on the CO2 levels at all. All right. If we move the fish around, it won't change the CO2 levels. But if we change the CO2 levels, it's going to affect the position of the fish. All right. So what we can see is that the CO2 levels do not depend on the position of the fish. We change that, we, we move the fish around in the tank, that's not gonna change the CO2 level. It has nothing to do with CO2 levels. But if we do the other way around, and we affect that, we change that CO2 level, it's going to affect the position of the fish. All right, so we know that the position of the fish depends on the CO2 pressure. So since the position of the fish depends on the CO2 pressure, A is gonna be the right answer here. So right here, when I click the answer choice, A is the correct answer here. Got the answer rationale here so you could pause the video you can read this definition if you'd like to um, for a further explanation of independent and dependent variables i do have a, a video uh, where i talk about this more in depth i think we cover this either the same question or something very similar so you can check that video out right now it might help you out